Thank you. Okay, so welcome along to the March GOHA webinar. Uh, the, the topic that we're going to do today is looking at the catalogue and acquisitions processes within the COHA uh, system. So very brief overview given the time available. And we are going to be looking at uh, different components for the cataloging and acquisitions combined with EDI and how that can smooth uh, the process from ordering to, to share. So I'm just going to um, share my screen and hopefully you can see that. If you can't, Helen will let me know. So the first slide to accompany the webinar today is just a full hands-on demonstration. So we're going to start by looking at the cataloging options and then we'll move on to acquisitions. Uh, the first thing I do have to stress, of course, is that as you would expect, everything is permission controlled. So access to all these areas that I'm showing you just now um, is dependent upon having the correct permissions. So we have our cataloging module available on the home screen if you've got permission to see it. And it's also available from the more drop down screen at this point as well. And there are different ways of cataloging as you would expect. You can do original cataloging where you're inputting the data from scratch onto the system. You can import records using say 3950 um, catalogs. So I'll be showing you that just shortly. You can also upload um, a file of mark data and uh, batch import those records. And of course, catalog records can be created as part of the acquisitions process as well. So we're going to look at the cataloging module and you can see that there's quite a lot of information on this screen uh, to do with the import options and editing options and also some tools so within the cataloging module you can do fancy things like create your spine labels and upload local cover images and so on but obviously with time as it is this afternoon we don't have um, that opportunity to delve in too deeply so we're just going to be looking at the basics. So we're going to start by creating a new catalog record. And the first thing to, to say is that COHA uses what's called cataloging frameworks to, um, to manage your, your, your cataloging templates. So these are all configurable by yourself in the libraries. And you can have as many templates as you want. Some of our libraries use different templates to catalog different material, whereas others just use one that covers everything and then just use the fields that they want. So just to give you a little bit of an example, um, I'll be coming back into the books template in a moment, but you can see that this is more of a lengthy template with quite a lot of fields, most of which I won't be using anyway. But if I come and have a look at a different example, if I look at fast ad framework, for example, you can see that it only has four fields exposed for, for entry. So you can have as many or as little as, as you want want. Now, if you prefer, you can use an advanced editor for your cataloging. So I can toggle my advanced editor on from here, or I can do it from the settings menu, the same thing to apply. And this allows me to sort of build up my catalog records using um, the, this editor here and putting in the, the tags and the, the subfield delimiters and so on. And we have a selection of keyboard shortcuts that can be used for that purpose. And also you can run various macros and, and so on from here. But again, that's getting a little bit too detailed for, for the um, webinar today. So I'm going to create a quick catalog record using the books template. And as I scroll down, you can see that we've got a floating tag bar at the top. So this allows me to go straight into a specific tag number if I knew what I wanted to enter without having to scroll down. So if I wanted to put a subject heading in and I knew that was in the 650 tab, I could just click on it here and I'm automatically taken to the correct place in my template. I'm going to come back to the top and I am going to, to mention that COHA is fully marked 21 and RDA compliant and therefore the templates that you see are sort of configured with that in mind. So you do see the mark tag numbers. Now some, uh, some libraries prefer just a template with labels and that's absolutely fine. You can switch the tags off if you wish and you don't have to see them there. It should also be noted 
noted that the labels are within your control, so you can label the fields in any way that you want. And you can also expand uh, the number of subfields that um, you see in your editor, and you can hide fields as, as well that you don't wish, wish to be exposed. So it's all completely within your own your configuration. You do have little question marks here. They are linked out to the Mark 21 website. So if you, again, if you wanted to, to hide that, um, you can. But if I click on the link there, you see it takes me to the appropriate page. But again, you've got the toggle switch there. So I'll put my tags back on. Now, the other thing to say is you can see at the right hand side that some of these fields have been marked as required. And you can also mark fields as important as well. Required field means obviously it won't allow you to save without putting data into that field. Other fields can be marked as important, but not mandatory, but you do want your cataloguers to, to you know, to be in, informed if you don't put any information in there. Some fields can be set to autofill just with a click like that. Um, and you can, if you want, you can come out and have a look at your tag editors, very relevant to fill out some information here in, for example, our 008. Um, fields we can put data in using the tag editor here. Now, just very quickly, I'm going to come over here and pull an ISBN I've saved. So I can round and put that into my ISBN fields and I'll just put, populate an author and a title as well. So I'm just going to do a title in here. I'm also oh, brilliant. Um, now, I'm not actually going to put any in other information in, um, again, for time factor, but I've got an ISBN, I've got an author, and I've got a title. And now when I save that, it is going to give me this warning, which tells me it suspected a duplicate record. And it gives me a link to the one that it suspects I already have in my catalogue. And this is correct. I've deliberately chosen one I knew we already had, and the match is done on the combination of the data that I've put in. So it's matched primarily on the ISBN, and it's seen I've got, you know, I've already got that in the catalogue. So I can go in and have a look at the record. I can edit the existing one, but actually, what I'm going to do is just save it as a new record. So I'm just going to pretend that I haven't already got that. Now I'm onto my items screen. And again, this is completely configurable. You can choose which fields to have displaying here, what labels they're going to get. And some of the fields have drop downs, so they're policy driven. Um, so I can put my shelving location in here if I want to. So I'll put it on general shelves. I can put barcodes in. I can put the item type in. And again, you can see this is a required field. So once more, you can configure which fields should be exposed within your template, what fields they've been, uh, what labels the fields have and if any of them are mandatory and so on. Now you can also um, create templates that you can apply and put the data in automatically for you. So those common things that you may be cataloging that you just want to, to sort of apply a template, you can do that quite easily as well. So I'm going to just add that item and then it comes up to the top and I could continue and add subsequent items if I want. I'm just going to move into the normal tab here now and you can see that I've got my catalogue record. It has pulled through a, um, a book jacket and that's coming from Amazon. That's matched on ISBN. So it has given me a, a match there. I've got my catalogue record at the top and I've got my holdings information underneath. Now on the left hand side you have menu options to work with this record so I could look at it in its mark form. I can go in and have a look at the item specifically and as time goes on if I check this item out um, I see its history and so on in here. I've got an edit menu which allows me to edit the records. I can, um, I can edit items in batch if there is more than one of them and I can delete items and so on from here too. Okay, we've also got the option to replace this record by an alternative source. So if you want to, if you just had a quick record on the system, you can up um, overlay that as well. So um, that's doing a, a quick example of original cataloging. I'm going to come back to my catalog and home screen now. And I am going to do this time a new record from Z3950 source. So again, I'll select my books format. This time it says which uh, catalog targets are you wanting to search? You can do parallel searching across multiple sources here. So I am just going to switch on Oxford University. 
I'm also going to switch on the National Library of Scotland and I'm going to switch on um, Library of Congress as well. This time, I'm going to get back into my text editor and pull the other ISBN that I've prepared. So I'll do a search on ISBN, so I want something very specific. Um, but obviously, you can combine your search terms as well. Search the Z3950 targets, and I'll just expand that so you can see it a little bit clearer. I've got hits that I've found um, on the ISBN that I entered as my search term both the National Library of Scotland and Oxford University. But the Library of Congress didn't have a match, which is absolutely fine. That's what I expected from there. So what I can do is I can have a look at the card catalogue view of these records. I can have a look at the mark preview of the records if I want to do so. And once I've selected the relevant one, I can import it into my catalogue and it pulls it through into that text editor we were looking at before. All the information from the incoming record is put in, and obviously then I can edit it as I, as I want, um, accordingly to match my own library settings. Okay. Um, I'll not bother adding the title in here, but you get the idea from there. I pointed out um, that from our cataloging home screen as well, we had these functions, so we can do things like batch item modification and deletions. We can also do batch record modifications, and that's where we can apply templates to change the, the metadata within the bibliographic records if I wanted to do so as well. So moving over into the acquisitions, um, so obviously that's another way in which you can um, create a catalogue record. So the acquisitions process works alongside the cataloging um, and Again, is fully permission controlled. So if I just come back to my home page, we've got our acquisitions button here. And again, it says to go from your more menu, but you will only see that if you put the permissions to do to do that. And even then, permissions within the acquisitions module can be quite granular. So you can, for example, allow people to create uh, to receive orders, but not actually to create orders. Or you can you can really restrict who can access which funds and so on as well. This is our acquisitions homepage, so we can create new supplier records, new vendor records using the button at the top. You can search your supplier database from here. You can manage purchase suggestions, but on the homepage as well, you see fund summaries. So this clearly maps down all the funds that you have on the system, and you can also see any hierarchical structure. So in this case, we've got um, We've got a books, a book fund, but that's broken down further into adult books and children books. And further down, we've got um, a fund, a library budget broken down by departments, and then again, sub fund for a campus and a sub fund for for you know the item type. So, just some examples of, of things that you can do here. Now, I'm not sure how clear it is from from what you're seeing on my screen, but your ordered and your spent amounts are hyperlinks. So if you want to go in and see at any time what's been committed against this fund, then you can click on it and it pulls through and you see lists of outstanding orders. And obviously from here, you've got links through into your title, into the order itself and into the supplier record. So that's quite a, a, a nice feature, a complete drilled down dashboards that's accessible um, from, the, from the home screen there. Right. I'm going to just do a vendor search. Um, so let's just do a search for Amazon. But I could have left that blank and it would have pulled through a list of all the suppliers and then you can select your relevant one from here as well. What you're seeing when you pull through a supplier is all num the number of baskets and subscriptions that are associated with this particular supplier and the status of them. So you can see here if anything is still outstanding, who has been created by along with dates and so on. And if any of the baskets are still open, you've got the facility there to add to the baskets. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm just going to create a new basket against this vendor. So I'll just put um, 1403 date. Um, that's fine. I don't need to put any other information in. So I'm creating my basket at this point. It tells me who the delivery and billing place is, who's created it, when it was opened and so on. 
I mean, when I add to the basket, I've got these different options. So I can create orders from existing records in the catalogue. I can create orders from suggestions be made from um, external sources, as you can say, 3950, from files and so on. Or I can do set, set up a brand new um, record, something that's not in the catalogue, and I've just got my little template here again, as I've just described with cataloging, you can um, configure what you see in here. So let's just put, uh, let's just put um, uh, an, an author, so I'll put in PTFS Europe as the author, I'll put in Ac, 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 Ac Made Easy, uh, let's just put in the date, we'll just put in it's 2024, okay that'll do. Um, and we're saying it's going to be ordered and that's fine. And it's actually, we know at this point it's going to be a book, so that's okay. So what we can now do is we can set which fund we're using to pay for this particular um, item. So let's just pick, uh, I don't know, let's just mean book fund. It may be that this, this fund is over encumbered, so I might get a warning in a minute, um, but that's okay. It may, it may be fine, it may not give me a warning. What I'm doing is, Collecting my fund, putting in the vendor price, it then calculates how many I'm ordering, applies any discount that's been assigned, and discounts can be applied at vendor level or they can be put in um, an individual order basis as well. And it will give me the actual cost associated with it. So I'm just going to save this without putting any more detail in here. Now that fund um, wasn't over encumbered, so I didn't get an alert. It has just accepted that. And it's added this order to my basket. So I can now continue um, to add orders to this basket if I wanted to do so. But let's imagine it's done, I'm finished, I'll close the basket and then, yeah, I'll confirm that it's closing. So to receive um, an order, I basically go find the vendor again. I would click the receive shipments and then I get the option at the bottom here to, to receive. So again, I'll just put today's data as, as the vendor invoice. And then it'll give me a list of everything that's pending against this invoice. And if you've got quite a lot, you can search for it. So I called it ACK, didn't I? So, oh, so I shall, yep, so there we found the table here. And we found the, the record put in the table. So I can just say, okay, I'm going to receive against that. At this point, I can make any changes. So if actually the cost was different, then I can say that when it, when it came in, the cost was actually $14.99 instead of $15.99 and my funds will be updated accordingly. I can also say how many I'm receiving. So if I'd ordered two, only one came in, I could, I could qualify that here. And over at the, the left-hand side, this is where you select that you're receiving it. And I can make any changes to it if I wanted to at the same time here. So if I wanted to assign a barcode or I wanted to put in shelving locations, call numbers, whatever I can do so at this point. But for now, I'm just going to confirm that. It will tell me that it's now been received. And again, once again, I can continue to receive against this invoice or I can just finish the receipt at which point I can close my invoice and that's it complete. So that's the, that's kind of a manual process. Now, of course, Koha um, uses EDI and is fully EDI compliant as well with the full suite of EDI. So we've got quotes, orders, uh, responses and invoices. So the process I've just demonstrated very, very quickly there can all be automated using EDI. And at PTFS Europe, we have worked with the with all main um, book suppliers. And basically, the way it works is that you set up EDI accounts for each vendor that you're using EDI with. And over uh, in the account information, it's where you specify what um, parts of the EDI process you're enabling with this particular supplier as well. So maybe for some suppliers, you would you would use quotes, orders and invoices. Some you would maybe just use orders with, et cetera. All of that can be controlled within the, the account. 
So essentially the same thing happens, um, but the process is automated. So if I just go back to my acquisitions page, and this time I'm going to look for the PTFS Europe um, vendor. Okay, let's have a look at um let's have a look at this basket. Okay, what we can see on this basket that wasn't available before is a create edifact order button. So if you're working with an EDI supplier and you are not doing auto ordering, which is another choice you can make with your, your account, if you're not doing auto ordering, the process would be that you would review the quote that had been sent in from the supplier and which creates the basket for you automatically. You would review the quote and then you would click create a de facto order which sends it back along the line to the supplier. Now, we do have within acquisitions the ability to look at these EDI messages. So there is nothing for the libraries to do. It is fully automated and the script would be set up on your server. And essentially that script can be run as frequently as you want as well. So it could be an overnight process. It could be run a couple of times a day. It could be run hourly. It really depends upon your library and the requirements um, of the acquisitions team. But the Edifact messages table here will give you a list of all transmissions that have been sent to and from. So from Koha to the supplier, from the supplier to Koha. And you can see that you've got the status of, of sent or received. So the process, if you're using the full suite, would be you would create your order on the supplier's website. They would pick it up at their end. They would translate it into a quote message that's sent through into Koha. You could pick up the quote from the messages and you could then review it, which would have created that basket. So we could see the basket here has been created. Um, you then just make sure it looks like what you, you selected on the vendor's website. You'd click create any fact order. It would then send it back down the line as an order. So the order there sent to the supplier. And then they pick it up, process it and send you the items. At that point as well, if you're using EDI invoices, that it would come through with an electronic invoice. So basically, the whole process can be automated depending upon the your book suppliers that you're working with. So, um, very close to the end of my allotted time. So I'm going. I appreciate that was a very quick whistle stop tour of the cataloging and the acquisitions module. But it's just designed to be. Um, that overview in this 30 minute webinar. I'm um, very happy to provide any of you attending with more information on any of the of what I've shown. Um, but I am going to stop there. Helen will stop the recording.